Muscles pull, causing limbs to move. Blood circulates, delivering fuel and picking up waste. To remove this waste, there are kidneys and lungs. And to keep the blood moving, there's the regular beat of the heart. Each one of us is like a very complicated machine, extremely efficient and incredibly well designed. We even have a built-in cooling system, sweating. But as in the best of machines, things are not always perfect. Would you like to come over here, please, Richard? Have a seat. Yeah, sit nice and close to me, please. Richard was born without his right hand. Luckily, it's a very rare fault, and one for which scientists have developed a working spare part. Now, can we take the hand off? In what there is of his forearm, the scientist is able to detect tiny bursts of electricity. Now, remember that noise you made before? Like a train. Can you make it as big as you can, please? That's not quite so good. No, that's only a tiny one. The bursts are produced as Richard uses the muscles in his forearm. By watching and listening, Richard can learn how to produce the best possible results. These tiny bursts of electricity can be used to control an artificial hand. He's just test you with this hand on the table here. Now, would you pass me your hand? I've got to put the battery in. The battery is needed to drive a small electric motor that's inside the hand. All that's needed to control the motor are those tiny bursts of electricity. So the opening electrode needs to be on the outside here. The electricity is picked up by special contacts called electrodes placed on the surface of the skin. The one needs to be on the inside. Now just make little short movements. Move slowly. Small movement. It's a matter of learning how to use his muscles to produce the right electrical signals that'll open and close the hand. I'll do that again. Normally, these electrical signals help to control our own muscular movements. With his new limb, Richard can now enjoy many of the things that others more fortunate than him enjoy. And he's certainly learnt how to use it. Someone else who seems to be enjoying himself is Denim. But Denim can never be far from a hospital. Three times every week he has a vital appointment to keep one hour's journey away from his London home. Denim has kidney failure, and this is a kidney unit. Here there are machines that will take over the job of the kidneys. If your kidneys have failed, waste products that collect in the blood will not be removed. This can cause puffiness in the face and serious illness. Without the kidney machine, life could be at risk. Denim has learned to set up one of these machines on his own. It consists mainly of controls and pumps. The most important part is this unit here, the artificial kidney itself. Before connecting himself up to the machine, Denim must get round to giving himself a local anaesthetic. He can now insert a needle into an artery in his arm. The needle's connected to a piece of plastic tubing and a syringe. A sample of blood is taken for analysis. This sample will be used to obtain a measure of the waste products that the blood contains. A similar connection is made to a vein in Denim's arm and further lengths of tubing connect Denim to the machine. Blood is now allowed to flow slowly out of his artery. On the machine, a special pump keeps the blood moving round and into the artificial kidney. 
Let's take an artificial kidney apart to see how it's made up. Inside, there are layers and layers of plastic sheets. Between each, there are two sheets of another material called cuprophane, a material that has a very important property. If it's put into water, it's found to be full of tiny holes, large enough for water molecules to get through. It's porous. Now, if on the top we replace the water by blood, we find the cuprophane will also let through many more substances, in particular the waste products. The trouble is it lets through some substances needed in the blood. But it's been found that if these are added to the water first to make a solution, then only the waste products would be filtered off. A whole range of substances are found to be needed. To supply the thousands of people on kidney machines, the solution is produced on an enormous scale. It's called dialysate. The concentration of each ingredient must be carefully controlled. Samples are taken from every batch that's made up for analysis in the laboratory. On these measurements, people's lives depend. People like denim. Getting rid of the waste products in the blood can take anything up to five hours on a kidney machine. In the process, more than 2,000 litres of dialysate will have passed through the artificial kidney. It's not the kind of machine you can carry about, but it is one you can have at home. This is another kind of artificial kidney, a larger version of the one in the hospital. It's put together by sandwiching the sheets of cuprophane between thick plastic slabs. That's one sheet. Blood will come in through this tube and leave through this one. A second sheet of cuprophane is put over the first, making a sandwich through which the blood will flow. It has to be carefully stretched over to avoid trapping any air. To complete the kidney, another slab of plastic has to go on top. Each plastic slab is specially designed to allow the liquid dialysate to flow between it and the cuprophane sheets. This particular kind of kidney can be used over and over again, unlike the one in the hospital, but it has to be rebuilt every week. Keeping a careful eye on things here is young Christopher, whose kidney this is. All that remains is to clamp the layers together. To make sure nothing leaks out, the knots have to be tightened to just the right amount. In most artificial kidneys, the blood flows through in one direction, while the dialysate flows through in the other. All that separates one from the other are the sheets of cuprophane. Waste products from the blood filter through all the time and are carried away by the dialysate. The blood circulates several times and each time more waste is removed. For people like Christopher, the machine is doing the same job as a normal kidney would otherwise do, filtering out waste products from the blood. Every day in hospital, people are being treated for the many things that might go wrong with them. Here at Brompton Hospital in London, patients who are found to have diseased or faulty hearts are being treated, including children. Most of the children in this ward are now recovering and will soon be going home. But this little boy has only just arrived. To understand what's wrong with him, we need to know what the heart is like and what it does. Doctors use this device to see inside the heart. It gives out sounds which are so high that we can't hear them. Ultrasound. 
The picture on the screen is produced by ultrasonic echoes reflecting off the walls of the heart. The walls are the brightest areas in the picture. The flaps moving up and down are valves inside the heart. Also inside are four chambers. They're the darker areas. Blood flows through these chambers, its direction being controlled by the valves. The chambers are arranged in pairs. On the left, the left atrium and the left ventricle, and on the right, the right atrium and the right ventricle. There's a wall between the two sides, but it's a bit difficult to see. Now the view you're looking at is rather unusual. It's the one you'd get if you try to look down and into your own heart. The more normal view is the one you'd get if you turned the patient round. Having changed the view, let's see what each side of the heart does. On the one side, blood comes in from the lungs and is pumped out round the body. It's bright red in colour and rich in oxygen picked up from the lungs. The blood's pumped out at a very high pressure. It has to travel to the top of your head and to the tip of your toes. It flows out of the heart through an artery called the aorta. On the other side, blood returning from the body is pumped through to the lungs. It's darker in colour and contains a waste product, carbon dioxide. The blood on this side is pumped out at a much lower pressure as it doesn't have to travel so far. The heart is a muscular pump, two pumps in one. The left side pumping blood round the body the right pumping blood through the lungs. But what's wrong with Stephen's heart? Cow. <laughs> it's cold, is it? <laughs> through his stethoscope, the doctor can hear a sound that tells him there's a hole in Stephen's heart. Good. The hole is in the dividing wall separating the heart's two pumps. It allows stale blood on one side to get through a mix with fresh blood on the other. But there's another fault. Around the entrance to this artery, extra muscle has grown, making it narrower than it should be. It's the way to the lungs and will have to be cleared. It'll mean a very skillful operation. So before we do any surgery at all, we just go through the anatomy. That's the right atrial, right atrial appendage, that's the low pressure chamber which drains into the right ventricle, which is this mass that we see here. And then the blood goes from the right atrium into this right ventricle up into the pulmonary artery, which you see here. And this bigger tube here is the aorta. So red blood is going up into this vessel around the body and the deoxygenated blood is coming into the right atrium, right ventricle and into the lungs to be oxygenated and that's all you can see from the front. The left ventricle is behind the right ventricle, behind this chamber and the left atrium is behind this chamber here. The surgeon can only operate on Stephen's heart if it's perfectly still and drained of blood. This means connecting him up to a machine that'll take over the job of both the heart and the lungs. Here, he's inserting a tube into the aorta. It's one of several that'll be connected to the bypass machine. So that is now into the aorta. We connect this part of the bypass machine up to this tube. We have to be sure that all air is out this line. Free of bubbles, you know, so there's no blood, there's no air from here down to the machine. The machine has now started to pump. Just as in the heart, it has two pumps one pumping blood through an artificial lung, the other pumping blood around the body. Stephen's life is now in the hands of a scientist who controls the machine. 
blood is now being drained out of the heart into the machine. You see the heart is now empty. See how white that is? Because we flushed all the blood out of it, you see? And now I'm going to work on the ventricle now. The surgeon is preparing to open up the ventricle. Once it's open, we'll be able to see right inside the heart, into one of the chambers. The ventricle is now open. You, of course, can't see the ventricular septal defect. That's the name for the small hole inside the heart that's got to be closed up. Can. And there are the muscular bundles which shouldn't be there. See how thick they are? See that thick muscle? This is the extra muscle that's making the entrance to that artery narrower than it should be. And I'm going to remove some of them like that. Because when they contract, they stop the blood getting out of this heart. They stop the blood getting to the lungs. See the thickness of that, you see? That shouldn't be there. Scissors. I'm just going to cut some of that off. Keep that, keep that system, that's going for research. And that's about all I need to free there. Okay, well this is the synthetic patch, which we're going to use to close the hole in the heart, because you can't just close the hole by pulling the edges together, because something's actually missing, and if something's missing, it means you've got to replace it with something. Bit on the big side. And you swing that round, just like that. And we now slip this down inside the heart. And there it is, lying nicely. You see? It's a big patch. We tie them. And there's that patch now in place, you see. The patch has been sewn across the hole in the dividing wall. It will now prevent blood flowing through from one side of the heart to the other, between the two ventricles. All that remains now is to close the hole the surgeon made in the outside wall of the heart. This is where another piece of synthetic material is needed. It's a different kind of material from that used to repair the hole inside the heart. The idea of this patch is to make the ventricle just a little bit bigger especially around the entrance to that artery where the blood flows out of the heart on its way to the lungs. Remember, that was the entrance that was too narrow, where the extra muscle was removed. Across into the left end, or through the ventricular septal defect, but one of the reasons that patients can die following this operation is failure to relieve the outflow tract of structure. Once this patch is sewn on, the heart can be allowed to start beating again. Well, you can see now the blood in this aortic cannula is different. It's a different colour to when we put it in. It's red. The heart's now working properly. So we're now back to where we were 40 minutes ago, so the hole is closed. And the obstruction to flow into the lungs is now removed. That's the end of the operation. For the next day or so, Stephen's life must be constantly monitored in an intensive care unit. It's taken careful and complicated surgery and all that modern technology can provide to restore Stephen's heart so that it will now work as it should. His parents can now look forward to having him home again fit and well. <laughs>